Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. This time out, we are honored to be joined by veteran drummer Chester Thompson, well known for drumming for such artists as Frank Zappa, Genesis, Phil Collins, and tons more. Chester has toured the world many, many times over with various artists, worked on a lot of great projects, and he sat down with our own drummer extraordinaire, Nick DiVirgilio, and they had a wide-ranging conversation about Chester's career, his gear, and about being a drummer. Check it out. Hi, welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. I'm Nick DiVirgilio, sitting in for Mitch Gallagher. We have a very special guest with us today, this is Mr. Chester Thompson. Chester, welcome. Well, How you doing? Nice to see I'm you here. good. Good to be here. This is your first time to Sweetwater, yeah? It is, yeah. And what do you think of the place so far? Man, I'm blown away. <laughs> Actually, I haven't <laughs> seen the whole thing yet. There's a lot I'm, to it, isn't it? It's amazing, yeah. You're here doing a uh, master class, a recording workshop with Stu Hamm and Carl Verheyen. Yeah. It's going well so far? So far, so good, yeah. yeah. They're really neat workshops, those things, bringing people in, showing, teaching them how to record. From the pros, it's, it's a good thing. Yeah, it's it's like I want to sit in the control room and hear the rest of what they're saying. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, cool. I'd be, just a quick talk today about a little bit about your history. Mm -hmm. uh, you've had, you've had a long and varied career, played with a ton of different artists throughout the years. So just mm -hmm. ask a little bit about that and um, how those went, how you got from from then till now, and the gear you play and mm -hmm. your style of drumming. So let's go back to the beginning. You started around age eleven or twelve, and you're from Baltimore, yeah. Maryland, right? Right. Yeah. Um, how did you get your start? Did you, like a family well, friend, I read. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, well, the actual sitting down behind the drums, yeah. It okay. was a, I mean, it's around that age, I had to play drums. I don't know where it came from, yeah. but I knew I had to play drums. Fortunately, uh, this family friend, I didn't even know he played. He was a close friend of my, one of my older brothers. He says, man, if you ever want some lessons, come on over. And nice. he didn't know what he was asking for. <laughs> <laughs> Every single morning, and it was like during the summer, I was out of school, I was ringing his bell, man. It was like over there every single day. You got into it quick. On into yeah. the next school year. And then by the second summer I was with him uh, at his house one day and someone called up looking for a drummer and he played jazz by choice. He wasn't interested in much else. And uh, he was about to hang up and then he turns around and goes, want a gig? And it's like, well, yeah. So that's where it started. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, once you got started playing drums, who who influenced you? Were you a big jazz jazzer at that point too? Oh yeah, that, at that point it was Max Roach, Art Blakey, yeah. uh, then later Elvin Jones, uh, and then later still Tony, you yeah, know, yeah. Tony Williams. But yeah, that was the, the early. Was in the fact, thing. the first lessons were all all about jazz. Really. Okay, first gigs were cover tunes, you know, like the soul right. music, of course. You know. And then I read that you you kind of joined a house band there in Baltimore, started. A lot of famous artists were kind of coming through this place. Yeah. Kind of well, how you lot, got yeah. to meeting these kind of people? Yeah, it was a club. Uh, it doesn't even exist anymore. It's called a club casino. Okay. And they would bring in guests that were, like, current in the, in the like I say, the soul charts. Right. And so I got to play with and meet a whole bunch of people. Nice. And, uh, yeah, doors started opening. And, and yeah, that's how it happened. It was cool. So what was your first tour? You've toured a ton throughout your career. What was <laughs> well, the very first stuff was it was a cover band I was in, and okay. we had a booking agent that worked us to death. We'd actually have to call this guy, like, we want to go home. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which was pretty cool. I mean, we worked mostly in the South, okay. just doing these clubs. And um, first name gig probably would have been Ben E. King. Sure. Did, did a you know, short run, a couple of short runs with him. Uh, so, let's see. Um, then Jack McDuff toured right. with him for a while. So that's how you got your feet wet. Did you really like Pretty being much. on the road? I mean, was it enjoyable for you being out there and playing in front of people every night? I'm sure it was. It was. Um, Grueling as well, I'm sure. Well, yeah, after a year of the McDuff gig, which was like long, long drives and getting there and setting up gear and playing, I decided, okay, I need to go back to school. This is like, okay. you know. And so I did. I finished a couple of years at a community college, which, hap which happened to have the faculty from Peabody Conservatory. Okay. They defected and decided to go teach ordinary people, you know? <laughs> right. So I had this amazing first two years. I was gonna transfer to University of Maryland. In the meantime, I got an audition with Zappa. Right. So That was Frank, gonna be my, leads right into my yeah. next question. <laughs> so, I've, I've played with a couple of different artists that played with Frank as well over okay. the years. And I know his music, I'm a fan of his music as well. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult sometimes. Some easier yeah. stuff, but I mean, very yeah. involved. So what was the audition like? What was the process you had to go through just in that initial audition? Well, for me, it was different because he already had a drummer. Ralph right, Humphrey was right. on the gig. So for me, it was just, we jammed. We just, okay. we played for like an hour without stopping. Okay. Uh, basically, George Duke, Tom Fowler on bass, and Frank, and uh, we just went at it, man. We just would sort of transition into everything. We played rock, we played 
shuffles and blues. We played some jazz. We, okay. you know, we played a little, all kinds of stuff, yeah. Latin. Nice. And at the end of it, Frank says, you got the gig, you know? <laughs> cool. So we start right in learning tunes. So we did that for a couple of days. No charts even, which was, you know, later I right. realized was surprising. And then the whole band showed up. Scared me half to death. <laughs> 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 yeah, it was like they played the hardcore stuff. Right. You know? Now, if this is correct, I read that you had to rehearse something like 40 hours a week or more for oh, weeks absolutely. on end before you go. I mean, because he, he wanted those shows, I imagine, really, really tight. Well, yeah, well, we rehearsed for a month, uh, yeah, 40 hours a week, yeah. and, well, 40 hours of, of band rehearsal. Then I'd wake up, I'd go to bed at 11, wake up around 3, practice till about 5. Jeez. Go back to sleep, get up, have breakfast, go to rehearsal. Wow. <laughs> that was it. You know, Amazing. Every day, man. Now, I... Kind of a technical question about that. How did you play with Ralph Humphrey? How did did, did Frank separate the parts out specifically? This you you play this, you play that kind of a thing. Some of it he did. Okay. Some of it he left to us. Okay. Um, some some things we played together, units and stuff. Right. Uh, Frank, you know, once he Frank wrote everything. Right. You know, so he would actually write for you a kid eventually, even right. you know. And uh, he very often started. He started hearing these double drum parts and and giving us those and uh, a lot of it was kind of up to us you okay know. an enjoyable experience i imagine huh it was an enjoyable experience oh, it was I imagine. Amazing. yeah, yeah cool. it was great so you ended up going to los angeles still playing with frank but then mm -hmm. that transitioned into i was reading you have a very good friend alfonso johnson yes, who kind of seemed yes. like it'd be a little integral part in your career just well, yeah. kind of the go-between for certain things well we went we started way back oh goodness we started playing together in like 69 or something okay. in baltimore uh He's from Philly, I'm from Baltimore, and we right. just would turn up together on these gigs sure. and stuff. And uh, he kept saying, man, you know, we're in town, come jam with the guys in Weather Report. Nice. And it's like, and my response was, well, yeah, I'd love to jam, but you, I really don't like auditions, man. I, you know, I get, I'm, I'm not comfortable with auditions. Sure. No, it's not an audition. Just come down and jam with the guys. It's like, okay. So I go down there, and of course there's another drummer there playing. Right. You know? <laughs> And we both would play, go back and forth. And this guy was unbelievable, man. I thought, wow, you know, this guy should really play with them. Right. And um, at first they was, you know, everything was really going amazingly. Then they played one of their very ethereal kind of ballad type things. This was all, this was not organized tune. This was just jamming, right. really. And the guy, for as amazing and powerful as he was, when they played something soft and pretty, he froze. He didn't had no idea what to play. Hmm. And fortunately, I'd been in you know several different kinds of bands, and that wasn't a big deal for me. Right. So, at the end of it, they were saying, "Well, what about two drummers? How you got? What do you feel about playing?" And it was like, "Well, you know, what, I, I've that. just <laughs> been doing that. I'm <laughs> right. not really wanting to do that right now, you know." So they offered me the gig and. And Frank had actually canceled a tour. Right. Otherwise, I, you know, I wouldn't have just jumped ship like that. Sure. You know? But he had canceled a tour. I didn't know enough people in L.A. yet to really, you know, really have a whole lot going on. And once I played that music, man, there was no turning back sure. from Weather Report. You know? I can imagine. <laughs> um, a little left turn here. So what kind of gear were you using back then? Oh, Small goodness. kits, big kits? I mean, were you, did, well, did it vary? My own kit was a little five-piece slingerland. Okay. Uh, twenty-inch bass drum. I actually had two eight by twelve toms because it came with one. So okay. then the trend started becoming like you know the double toms. So I ordered you know order an extra one. And uh, then one day Ralph and I show up to rehearsal and our kits were not on stage. We both had five piece kits. There's these two Ludwig Octoplus kits on stage. Okay. You know the big twelve piece yeah. guys. So suddenly it's like it was really intimidating because you sit there. What do you do with all this stuff and the first impulse is, well, I got to play all these drums, and then I realize, no, you play the sounds when it's up. But right. in the meantime, you just overplay like crazy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but and I stayed with that kit. I actually bought it from Frank when I left, and um, did it with played those with Weather Report, okay. and kept that same kit up up until the first Genesis tour. Okay. After that, I got my first endorsement with Pearl, actually. All right. You know, so I pretty much duplicated the kid with concert toms and, you know, 12 pieces on that. Okay. You know. All right, so um, you played with Frank for a number of years. What, uh, some of the, let us know some of the recordings you played on. Okay, the first thing was called Roxy and Elsewhere. Yeah. Then One right, right, Size right. Fits All. Yeah. Uh, then there was some, <laughs> one called Studio Tan. 
which was one of his narration sort of <laughs> like operettas, I guess right. you'd call it. And I turned up, uh, there was something later that was released called You Can't Do That On Stage Anymore Volume 2, which was a complete concert from Helsinki, Finland, actually. Nice. And um, I've turned up on lots of various bits and pieces. Gail keeps releasing stuff. Yeah, they you have, know. it's amazing <laughs> that the vaults that they still have there with yeah, all the yeah. recordings that nobody's heard still. It's amazing. Right. And with Weather Report, Black Market was one of the, uh, yeah, well, that's, your main recording on that, right? Yes, yeah. And it's come out on some composite stuff. I mean, right, right. you know, but yeah, that's the only album I actually did with them, yeah. And uh, what was it like working with, you, know, you You got to play with Jocko for a little while, didn't you? Very briefly. Okay. Uh, the whole year was with Alfonso. We toured for a year before we did Black Market. Okay. Uh, so Alfonso was leaving. Uh, there was some... You know stuff that I would really wasn't party to. I was I'd actually gone home for Christmas, back to Baltimore and see some family. Came back, all these changes had taken place, which I knew nothing about. Alfonso had left the group basically. Right. Yeah, they, I read about that. They thought that yeah. you might have left the band with. Well, they right? assumed that I left with them because well, Alfonso and I were real close. Okay. You know? And um, so they didn't ask. They just assumed that I left. So they when so when they hired Narada, it was like, well, who do you want to play with? So he suggested uh, Narada Michael Walden. So I get back in town and call up, like, when are we going back in the studio? What's, what's up, guys, you know? And there was this real awkward yeah. you know, <laughs> stuff <What>? going on. <laughs> and it's like, well, didn't you quit with Alfonso? It's like, Alfonso quit? What are you talking about? Right. Yeah. Well, if you didn't quit, so am I in the band or am I out? What's up? You know, so, well, if you didn't quit, you're still in the band. So I ended up going back in the studio doing some stuff and... As it turned out, Narda had started doing a couple of things, and right. and uh, he did a beautiful job on Canon, which was just an amazing ballad that Joe wrote. Black Market, they gave him the credit, but it actually, in actual fact, the first half of Black Market is me playing, and then when it goes to the bridge, it, there's an, it's an edit, and it goes to a different day, different, you know, everything, different right. feel, different ambience, the whole sound is different, and that's Narda, you know. Wow. <laughs> but they didn't get, put both our names down, right. so... So yeah, early on you you got to well you experienced some of the typical things that musicians go through trying to be a pro musician. You you never <laughs> it's never a smooth road, is it? It always kind of up it and down. You never know what's going to happen one day. It happened long day. before California. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, cool. It's it's an exciting life. What right, can I say? For sure. <laughs> so from then you get go into the uh, the Genesis gig and still through Alfonso. You got the he, Phil Collins. I this is what I read. Right, Phil Collins yeah. talked to him and got your number through Alfonso, and that's how right. you got the call about that job. Yes, yeah. And what was that like, receiving a phone call from Phil Collins? Were you, did you know of Genesis Music at that point? I only knew of one album because on the last Weather Report tour, we toured Europe, and we used trains. We didn't fly. We actually did trains for the whole tour, which was really cool. Yeah. So Alfonso would have his boom box in there, and he'd be playing, uh, I guess it was Trick of the Tail, which was the first album with Phil, Phil. singing. Yeah. And that, to be honest, that was the first time I'd ever heard Genesis. And I dug it. It was okay. like, I mean, it was kind of background music because we were always talking, so I didn't really get a chance to really dig in. And, and, right. and But at the same time, I really liked what I heard. So I get this phone call. <clears throat> Excuse me. This English voice on the line, and, uh, yeah, it's like, this is Phil Collins. Would you, would you be interested in joining Genesis? Uh, no audition involved. He, you know, he played um, Roxy and Elsewhere for the guys so they could hear the two drummer in action. Right. He had actually come to the last concert, as it turned out, that I played, which was uh, in London. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and for me, the thing that excites me most, even still, is playing something new that I've never done before. Sure. And I'd certainly never done any British rock at that right. point, so, you know. Yeah. So cool, went cool on, story. Went on over and yeah. <laughs> started rehearsing, and it was cool. So, uh, what, so that's a question I have for you. What was that like, going from playing kind of American jazz and <laughs> funk and soul music to British pro progressive rock. I mean, how, did you have to think about it differently or did you just, did they allowed oh, you man. just to do your thing? That was the most different thing I'd ever run into culturally and musically. Sure. It was like, this is pre-drum machine days. Right. So things, you know, things are too homogenized now, I think. You know, with the drum machines, everybody's got loops, everybody's got drum machines. So the music, wherever it comes from, there's this sameness that happens a lot. I mean, you still get some different flavor, but not at all like before there was all this stuff, you sure. know. They were really, really English. I mean, you know, it was like a quarter note was really a quarter note. Yeah. You know, 
<laughs> there's a, a funny story, which was true, that I told, you know, tell at clinics. I, there was this one song that was really hard for me to get the right feel because Phil kept saying, no, that's not, not it. It was a ballad of all things, you know, in that quiet earth it's called. And it's just a very straight thing. And, and so finally I said, man, what is it, you know, what do you need differently? What's the deal? He says, well, it's, it's just, you know, you just, it's just straight. It's like you're walking, boom, bop, boom, bop. And I, so I was able to play it, which I didn't say out loud at the time. I didn't back in my mind. I'm realizing, oh, okay, now I get it. Because where I grew up, we didn't walk like that, right. you, know? <laughs> you know? So I had to really learn how to take all the, you know, there were ghost notes, but they didn't, couldn't swing. Right. Not in the same sense, you right. know? Right, yeah, yeah. At one point, I went to a club. We had, like, you know, one night there was a club near where I was staying, and I just went there just to watch people dance. Because I've, I've always found there's a correlation between drums and dance, you know, because I, I love learning music from different cultures. And when I saw how people danced, there was that very straight, you know, not a whole lot of swagger. And it's like, oh, okay, I get it now, <laughs> you know, and that actually helped lock it in. You know? Okay. Well, it seems like, uh, so the first tour you did with Genesis, let me step back, it was uh, Wind and Weathering, right? Yes. For that, for that yeah. record. And uh, what were the size of the gigs like? Did, did it go, was it, because I mean, <laughs> Genesis grew into the, one of the biggest bands in the world right. for a while, though. So was it big venues at the start of that kind of stuff? Or? Oh, no, 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 yeah. no. no. Uh, first of all, audiences were probably three-fourths, if not more, male. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, like, it was pretty, pretty intellectual Typical stuff. Typical progressive pretty, rock yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> pretty heady stuff. Yeah. Not a huge lot of, not a big percentage of guys with girlfriends that wanted to show up at those concerts, yeah. you know. Um, average concert was probably 1,000 to 3,000, okay. depending where we were. Right. You know, my very first tour was an English tour, so we'd play these really crazy venues. I mean, wherever they could fit people in was a venue. Okay. You know? How was the experience with Phil when you guys were doing the double drumming stuff? Is it stuff you kind of just made up on the fly? Like the, your solo, the, the, the Chester and Phil solo that I've mm -hmm. known for many years, mm -hmm. it's, it's different but the same. There's always like there was a core of it that kind of stayed right. the same over the right. years. Is that something you guys just worked at one time and kind of kept it flowing from there? Or Well, the, the, the be in the very beginning, I pretty much set it up because okay. uh, Phil is... A incredible player that he was, he he was not comfortable with sp playing solos. Yeah. Even with all the Brand X stuff he'd done and all that, he just never took solos. Okay. So I kind of put together the first couple of things, and they kind of grew from there. And then as after we had done a couple of tours of them, then just of course sad, he started. Yeah. Well, he started having you know pretty clear, you know opinions, and you know. At one, at some points, that some points were really different, but then there was always that sort of core kind of animal jungle kind of sure. you know tribal kind of thing going on, and uh, then we'd branch off from that. You know, over the years they got more sophisticated. It definitely got longer. Right. <laughs> nice. A couple of them were singles, man. You know, a couple of them were actually you know throughout South America were actually singles. Wow. <laughs> cool. Let's jump forward a little bit into mm -hmm. sort. You stayed with Genesis for a while. Mm -hmm. I'm sure doing other things on the side as well. But when you starting in the '80s, Genesis and Phil they kind of really exploded, especially in the right. mid '80s. Right. Became this juggernaut, huge, huge band. Mm -hmm. So my question is now: Gear started to change about somewhere mm -hmm. in the mid '80s. Oh yeah. And I remember the Invisible Touch tour and these kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Samples and triggers and start were mm -hmm. starting to being used. So how what was the beginning stages? If you putting electronics into your drums. Uh, okay, so yeah, what basically, I mean, most of those triggers, we most of the samples were actually just taken from the multi-tracks because, you know, starting with Phil's first solo album, he was playing along with, you know, experimenting a lot with the uh, gated verbs and, mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, you know, lots of compression and stuff. So what we would do to pull that off live to not make the front of house guy crazy we realized, okay, we need to sample this stuff. So we would go in, go in this studio. They had their own studio, so we'd actually go in to the actual multi-tracks and uh, actual sample, you know, the affected sounds and stuff. Right. And let's see, back in those days, what were we using? My goodness. Um, I was using using quite a lot of Simmon stuff. He was actually playing a Simmon kit yeah, in those days. and. I went. I later got a Simmons as well. I think I did the seven. He had the fives because I didn't want to play on those those, those tabletop yeah, things. Yeah. 
He had a good way of using them. He cranked that thing up so loud in his monitor that if you did more than touch it, it would take your head off, okay. you know? And that protected his, his hands because you could, people did damage on those things. Yeah, it was like playing on this hard floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So, uh, so we, we had that period and then it was mostly sampling those affected drum sounds, you know. But did you have a trigger like on your snare drum to play that gated snare sound? Yes, so, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, we'd play, oh goodness, I'm trying to go back because we did several versions sure. as the technology changed. Yeah. I can't, I'm trying to remember what the very first samplers were. I, I used some Dynacord samplers. Those were really easy and, you know, did it really well. I'm trying to think what it was prior to that because I think we were using some 12-bit stuff before the 16-bit stuff came sure. along, you know. So you had yeah. to kind of roll with the technology then. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Well, how did you feel, how did you take it as a musician going from the smaller gigs up to these ginormous concerts. I remember seeing you guys at Dodger mm -hmm. Stadium in LA. It was like 90,000 <laughs> people there. Huge stage, tons of technology. Do you think about the gig differently? Do you play differently on, a, on a, something that enormous? Only the first gig. Okay, because it's like it's new. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's amazing what you can get used to. Right. I mean, at the end of one tour, I remember, I think it was, must have been Invisible Touch. We were doing some stadiums and stuff. And I remember when we did an arena, it felt intimate. <laughs> 20,000 people, suddenly it's an intimate gig. I mean, come yeah, on. Yeah, right. you know? So it's, it's perspective. It's all sure. perspective, you know. Uh, now, uh, going back to a gear question, and a technology question, on those big tours, were you using wedges? Because I don't know if your in-ears were kind of brought at that point. I wish I had. Well, they first, they introduced, let's see, they, they offered to do inner ears. It might have been 92. Oh, okay. And... I didn't have fitted ones, and I tried some generic single drivers, and they were awful, and right. it's like, now nah, stay with the wedges. Okay. I'm paying the price. I've got some tinnitus going on, really? which I'm not a fan of. Of course. Um, so, yeah, the wedges were, I had stereo wedges, so they could separate out the keyboard and guitar sounds. Okay. And, uh, and I was playing, like, hard as everything, and they had to be loud enough to be over that. So, yeah, I did some, it was pretty silly. I didn't, it should have probably at least been wearing earplugs, and I didn't. Right. Yeah. So do you use in-ears now with they, all your playing? Yeah, yeah. I love, well, even in the studio, I use in-ears okay. now. Like, I'll be using them today. Okay. And when we finish out the workshop, I'll be actually using in-ears. Okay, yeah, me too. I mean, it's, yeah, they're a great invention. Yeah, yeah well, and they I, sound I, better and better all the time. And I keep mine fairly quiet. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to, can, they yeah. don't have to, like, you know, blast anymore, sure. you know. So you went, now, with, you went from Genesis, lots of Phil Collins gigs as well. Now, his music is obviously different than Genesis stuff, right, very much right. more in the pop vein, kind of straight ahead mm -hmm. stuff. Um, d d different mindset going into his stuff, but since it was the same artist, so to speak, to totally, totally different Totally thing. different world. Yeah. Totally different world playing his stuff and the Genesis stuff. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, uh, probably in some ways closer to the stuff I'd played a lot of my life, you sure. know, because a lot of his stuff is kind of R&B based, kind of right. soul based. And... Um, the Genesis stuff uh, was, you know, probably more challenging, you know, as far as the prog rock, all the right. odd time stuff and all of that, you know. Cool. Um, I th and I read somewhere during that time, I'm not sure, I forget exactly what year, but you, you got to play on a Peter Cetera record. Was that, it was a number one hit song. Was that one of your yeah. first kind of number one it, yeah. records that you got it, to play on? It was the first number one. I think I've only played two, actually, but that was one of them. That was the first one. Yeah, uh, Michael and Martin was a friend. Okay. And, you know, he called me in to, to work on this thing, and it was amazing, man. We spent like 30 minutes on a downbeat, you know? <laughs> that, really? that, that, yeah, that Getting was real like. specific. Well, that was like the, the start of the whole sequencing era, era and all of that. And, um, you know, he was, I mean, f phenomenal musician, but he was also really making full use of the technology. And sure. so that thing had to be absolutely no wavering anywhere. And it totally changed my way of practicing. I had to like suddenly get back on the metronome, which I did it in the beginning, but hadn't right. done for years. And and with all the, you know, suddenly everything was on a click. And and uh, at one point I got a little nervous about playing with a click and I just thought, okay, this is, you know, this it, it is what it is. That's what you got to do now, sure. you know. Well, so, the, so the, did you find that the Genesis, Phil Collins gig and those playing with those guys opened up these other doors for you? I mean... Since the band was so big and these artists were so big, were you finding you were getting other jobs because of it? 
I was or, almost, it was almost like I was losing sessions because I was never well, there. You were, yeah, you missed the <laughs> like you know, crazy, yeah. So the session part, you know, at, after Weather Report, I did a ton of sessions, uh, lots of fusion stuff. Okay. Um, then our tours would be so long in those days, and Genesis would tour one year, Phil would tour the other. So I was just constantly traveling. The good thing was on the Genesis tours, families were welcome, so I got to take my family along, nice. you know, so I didn't, didn't have that penalty, but... Um, yeah, it was, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's hard to say uh, as far as other, you know, other commitments, be, you know, through them, because the period that, that I was in LA, by the time I transitioned to Genesis, I actually had a pretty great base of friends and people I was working with. And so I didn't, I can't say I really got a lot. I did a couple of little odd uh, things around England, but not right. very much. Okay. Not very much. Nice. But now you ended up playing with the guys as well. <laughs> yeah, mine was a weird story. It's, 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 we have a few mutual friends as far as okay. that's concerned. But yeah, I, I was playing with Tears for Fears ah, for a while. One of my favorite bands yeah, in the world. Yeah, it was a great actually, time. Man. And <laughs> my friends called me up. It's funny, it's all about who you know and friends mm -hmm. who have other, other friends and connections. They called me up and said, we heard on the radio Phil quit the band and they might be having auditions. You should try and get an audition. Mm -hmm. I happened to be in London. Oh, so I went okay. to Hit and Run Music and I brought mm -hmm. a CD to Carol Willis and the people there and invited okay. them to show. And long story short, Nick Davis called me about six months later and asked me to send him some more stuff and then they flew me to audition mm -hmm. and I ended up recording at the farm mm -hmm. for on a few tracks. It was a very bizarre experience because <laughs> I was a big Phil Collins fan growing up as a kid right. and loved Genesis and all that kind of proggy music. And then mm -hmm. ending up being playing with them was a weird a turn of events for me. Wow. But it's neat sitting here with you because yeah. we have that little thing in common. Well, it was an odd time for them. I mean, because like say Phil left and they were determined they didn't want to go back. They didn't want to use Daryl or myself anymore. They, yeah. they wanted to do something totally new. But, oh, they wanted to go back to the prog rock days, was my understanding, you know. So yeah. the stuff you did, it was more along those lines. Not right? really. To oh, me, it, okay. it wasn't very proggy at all, to me. Well, okay. It was, uh, <laughs> it, it sounded like what they were doing at that time. Ah, um, what was the record? Okay. We Can't Dance. It sounded similar to that vein of stuff that they were doing. Okay. Um, but even so, it was still a great experience for me. Oh, great. Yeah, it was Good. really cool. All right, so now we're going to have the time where you leave Los Angeles and you end up moving to Nashville, yeah? Yeah, that was some place I'd never expected to be. <laughs> and what, what made you go to Nashville? It Just was, a different a change of scenery? I don't know what it was. Well, I do know what it was. Um, I loved L.A. for the most part, but then the last couple of years I was starting to get a little restless. Okay. Um, ended up in Nashville for a funeral of all things. Larry London had become a dear friend, and he was doing like the lion's share of the sessions in Nashville. Went in there, um, got in the day before. This is pre-GPS, so I had to get a map from the right. gas station and get my little pen out and mark where I was going, got right. the addresses. And so, I, and I drove around everything the day before because I didn't want to like be late trying to find stuff. So I you know, drove around and just kind of fell in love with it. And it was like, wow, what is this place? You know, Went home, mentioned to my wife, what do you think about Nashville? And she's, and she's like, well, I don't, you know? Right. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Her and my son made it clear that if I wanted to move there, they'd come visit, you know. Nice. We ended up, as a family, going to spend a week just to, to see. Right. And by the time that week was up, we'd bought a house, registered oh, my son in school. We the knew. whole thing, yeah. When we got there, we knew that was going to be home. Okay. You know? And my son was turning 13. I needed off the road. I hear that, yeah. And I had already let Phil know that I wasn't going to do his next tour because I just couldn't do both anymore. And for 13, like I say, that's when I started doing clubs. I grew up without a dad. And uh, it was a crazy, whacked out time because I'm doing, I'm living this dream. I'm playing these dinky little dives, but I'm actually playing drums. But I had nobody to talk to, like the, the transition boy to man kind of thing. Of so I just felt like I cannot be on the road for, when my son turns 13, you know. That happened to be the time when the move happened and all of that. Okay. So it was just a different world, you know. Nice. And how did you find, what kind of sessions were you doing when you, when you showed up there? Did it take a while to kind of fill in? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, when I first got there, I was shocked because I'll go in the studio and it's like all L.A. guys. It's like, wait a minute, what's going on right. here? I had no idea there was 93, the year I moved, I didn't realize there was a big exodus from, from L.A. of musicians down right. there. Because I went for the family. I didn't go chasing a career down there. Sure. And... Um, it's a weird town in some respects. It's like a, I run into a lot of people, they get upset because it's like they welcome you there, but 
they wait to see if you're going to stick it out before they start calling you. Sure. It's, it's very interesting. At the same time, I've always worked getting on and off a plane, so that wasn't a big deal. I still had enough stuff coming in that it's been fine. Uh, the sessions I get down there these days are actually more jazz. People are like, very surprised that there's jazz in Nashville, sure. but there's some great jazz players. And, I mean, for me, you know, I, now I'm doing the thing I've always wanted to do is leading a group. So, right, you're, you're a trio, yeah? Yeah, it's a little jazz, it's an acoustic trio. We do some electric stuff, you know, okay. roads and, and the electric bass. And what's but, the names of the other guys in the band? Uh, the piano player's name is Joe Davidian, okay. who has quite the reputation. The guy's a phenomenal player. Nice. And the bass player is Michael Rennie. Okay. And they're both younger than my sons, which cracks me up, you know. <laughs> uh, but they play like they're in their 50s or 60s, man. But with that energy of nice. the youth, it's, it's pretty cool, pretty fun. Cool. That's, that's really great to hear. Um, if you don't mind me asking you now about some of the gear and your playing style mm, before okay. we end this interview. Um, mm -hmm. you've, had, you've played a number of different uh, brands of drums over the year. Now you've been playing DW for quite a while, I think. Yeah, since 99, yeah. And how do, what do you have to say about that product? What do you, how, well, what do you think about I'm those drums? I'm loving them, man. They, uh, when, they, when I found out they made their own shells, when they started doing that, that's when I really wanted to get involved because I prefer thicker shell drums because I tend to hit pretty hard and... Thin shell, I tend to max them out. Well, you know, I'm not playing as, as hard these days. I still practice that way to keep my chops up. Sure. But, but the stuff we play, a lot of times I'm playing a lot of acoustic jazz gigs, and I'm playing very quietly. I actually had different sticks made for that. Okay. Yeah, but it's really intense. I mean, I, like I say, I, it's, for me, it's more the East Coast style of, you know, it's quiet but intense. Sure. Um, and... So I've got my first ever jazz kit with an 18-inch bass drum. Nice. <laughs> but I still usually show up with at least a 20-inch kick and, you know, four or five toms. Okay. It's like, I like my notes. Man. Sure, <laughs> you know? yeah, why not? But, yeah, I mean, I've, I've got some, been doing some custom ride cymbals. Sabian's great and let me design ride cymbals and stuff, so nice. I've been doing some of that. And, um, but I'm definitely using different gear in this setting than I would, say, if I was of course, going out, you know, doing a big pop yeah, tour or sure. something, yeah. Now, I've also noticed over the years that you sit incredibly high to, for a drummer <laughs> like myself. Now, have you always done that I mean, since, you, since you first started, or did, did you raise as you kind of I've went through your career? It. I have tried everything, you know, because I used to watch the jazz guys. I mean, I, I, they'd always look like kind of hunched over the drums, and sure. so I tried that, and then my back would hurt. Okay, right. that's not working, you know. Uh, the guy that first taught me sat fairly high for the time, and... He had actually made a throne out of a snare drum stand and a bicycle seat okay. you know, with the long pole. Right. And so I learned sitting on this thing, and I was pretty small as a kid. So I don't know. And the, but then the combination of going to school and playing timpani in, in school bands and stuff, and the thing of playing down on the timpani, I love timpani and the moving around on them, and I kind of approach the kit that way now. So you kind of sit over the drums a yeah. little bit. You can yeah, kind of exactly. see them from above. Nice. Yeah. And you've, I've noticed you've played uh, tri uh, match grip. Do you yeah, ever, did you ever play traditionalism? Oh, goodness. The first 11 years, I was pretty hardcore. Okay. I thought that was the official way to play. Right. Um, there were some bugs in it. I didn't get a pr have a private teacher you know, as far as rudimentally and stuff like that until I was a senior in high school, which I'd already been doing gigs since 13. Right. So, like, I, you know... Like I learned how to play a role with the stick going sideways, for example. Right. So when I tried to correct it, it was pathetic. You know? For me, the, the switch to match grip, when Frank ordered the giant drum kits, he would write for your kit. So a lot of times I'm like on the big toms and Ralph's up top or vice versa. Well, every time I get over here where I've got this like 15, 16, 18, I've got to go match because I couldn't get generate enough power that way. Right. I get back over here, try to switch back. You've never seen me twirl sticks, and you won't. There's a reason for that. You know, <laughs> my hands just don't work that way. All right. So it's like, and I just realized, okay, I've got to, this is not working. I've got to commit to this. And, and I just spent some lots and lots of hours trying to, you know, trying to make that transition, trying to copy what this hand did. So lots of eyes closed, trying to feel the muscles, you know. Sure. And, yeah, it's like, for me, it was a, a big improvement. I look at guys like, you know, Vinny and, and Steve Smith, guys that have stayed with it, and it's, they're amazing. But yeah. for me, the match thing works better. Totally. 
And mm. one, almost one final question: You still practice after all these years? Oh yeah. You still man. sit behind a pad on a pad and. and yeah, there's too many guys like you around to compete with. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> I gotta practice. There are some crazy yeah. drummers out there these days that are really, taking yeah, it to the. the they really are. The, the, the next level as far as speed and, oh, and dexterity and absolutely. stuff is crazy. Well, Chester, thank you so much for your time mm. and for this interview. Uh, good luck with the rest of the uh, recording workshop, and uh, we hope to see you back here at Sweetwater again sometime. Well, I hope you come back. Thank you. Okay. All, right. All right. Thank you for watching the Sweetwater Minute. I'm Nick DiVirgilio, sitting in for Mitch Gallagher.